Hey guys, this is uh, Angel from JJLM uh, Life Team in Manteca, California, the hub. I just wanted to drop a short lesson here. Um, you know, we're always constantly with JJLM Ministries. One of the things I've learned with Curry Blake is the consistency of not just teaching theology, but application. Because what good is it if we teach you that the scripture says it, without giving you some foundation and how to apply it. And I think that's where a lot of the church misses what it's intended to do, and which is make disciples and, you know, create, make strong Christians um, <clears throat> for those that are willing to venture in that adventure and journey. Uh, so I want to just kind of talk about some things here. Uh, I want to begin the process of putting some lessons together um you can get the you can get the manual curry has uh did this having faith for others uh it's really really good and i want to just kind of go through that thought process very slightly uh, i'm not going to necessarily go off of that off of the material even though it's incredible material and really really help you but i want to just kind of put some lessons together using that in short spurts videos on youtube podcast i want you guys to be able to take these these thoughts slowly i would definitely uh think you should get the manual go go, go on jjlm uh store download the manual and it will definitely help you um listen to curry's sermon on that it would absolutely uh strengthen you as well but i want to do this in short bites and so i just want to lay one quick foundation that seems to be I run across this a lot, and it's this this thought process that uh, of the sovereignty of God. Scripture does teach the sovereignty of God, but I think it's misdefined. Um, I think it's misdefined for misdefined for several reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is really a lack of productivity. Um, so nobody wants to say that, but the reality is the church hasn't been very effective. So it's easier to lean on the sovereignty of God. Well, if God chooses to. Um, and I want to break that. I want to slightly get into that today and then break through those that that sacred cow as we continue about having faith for others. And so it, it is a, a it's a scapegoat. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, if it, it, I'm not saying that God is not God, I'm not saying that God is, is, is the, not the most powerful thing in the universe. God is the Holy spirit. Spirit of God is the most powerful thing in the absolute universe. Don't get that twisted. That's not what I'm arguing or debating, but I think the second most powerful thing in the universe is your will, your will to choose and decide what you're going to do, because it is the only thing that God will not violate. God will violate the will of the devil. He'll violate the will of a demon. He'll violate all of those different things. Uh, you think that ram wanted to be caught in the thicket when Abraham went to go sacrifice his son, but what did he caught? He, what, what did the Bible say that God caused the animal to be caught in the thicket there? And we can go into some Old Testament text about what God chooses to do and everything else. And, and, Man, if you have any questions, message me. I'd love to go over those things with you because it's just a misunderstanding of the heart of God and what's happening throughout the Old Testament, how God had to deal with man during a particular time. But anyways, let's get into this. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 uh, begins by saying this. Genesis chapter 2 verse 5 says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. In verse 15, it says, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So since the beginning of time, God never did anything apart from working alongside with man. Never did it. God never did did anything as far as um, 
trying to usurp that. God always operated in that order. And that has always been since the beginning of time. You know, even whether it's right there, it says, okay, God never even allowed a, you know, the, a, a rain to fall until there was a man to till the field. What is that saying? God, God was patient. But at the same time, God never intended to just create you and I to just be there as robots without having our uh, co-laboring with him. As Paul said in the New Testament, we are co-laborers with him in Christ. And that's not a dummy statement or an exaggeration, just going, ha, 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 you know, God's actually doing it all. But you're just kind of going along for the ride. No, Christ did it all. So he did the heavy lifting. And now it's our turn to take in and capture a defeated foe. But in the beginning of time, God set this precedent of saying, I'm not, you're going to do it with me. I'm going to do it with you. This is relational. This is communion. This is union with Christ or, or in that time, this is union with God, Adam and, 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 and that Adam and Eve had with God. Even we get to the story of Noah and the Bible says that, you know, the flood's coming and all this stuff, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sorry, not Noah. Um, in the beginning with Adam, the Bible says that he brought the animals to Adam. So Adam to name them. God didn't even name them. He gave, he gave the responsibility of the earth to Adam and said, you tend it, you deal with it, you process it. This was prior to the fall. That's the way God looked at it. Man, that Adam was to have dominion and authority over the earth. So then the fall comes in. Satan comes in and all that stuff happens. And I'm going to skip over a lot of that detail. And I'm, uh, we can talk about it another time. And we will. Definitely will. Talking about dominion and authority. But then we get to uh, the text in Psalms 115, verse 16. And it says this. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's but the earth he has given to the children of men. So now I'm quoting to you during the law, during the law period of time that God is writing through, uh, um, David is writing through the Psalms and he's saying, the Lord, the heavens is the Lord's, but the earth belongs to the children of men. So this is the part that I have about sovereignty. Uh, and what I constantly see is we're constantly wanting to say, well, it's up to God. When the reality is God is, and we're going to get into this talking about having faith for others and praying, you know, laying hands on the sick more and more, it'll get more detailed. I just want to lay just something very quick and a quick thought. You know, we learned through COVID-19, 2020, um, and even the riots that were taking place all over the country. We learned the jurisdiction and the authority that takes place. The United States is a sovereign nation. Um, at the same time, this sovereign nation has given sovereignty to each state. So when Chaz took over uh, portions of city of Seattle downtown, the federal government didn't have the right to just bombard and bulldozer over uh, the city. The governor had to request it and the mayor had to accept it. And that's why our federal government never was able to to do that because it would be bypassing its constitutional rights and laws in that it stated that. And so when we learn what we learned through anything of COVID-19 is how much authority and power mayors have, um, governors have, obviously in California, we learned that real quick, how much authority the governor has. And even though the president of the United States might have funds and allocations and all these different things and thoughts and ideas. If the governor disagrees, if the president says something and the governor disagrees with it, it's not happening in that state. And even in, and through that, even when the governor says something, the mayor still has something else to say that he can implement or choose not to. And they can push back and forth and everything else. But we learn that. Well, see, that's sovereignty. For instance, scripture, see, we, we, we are constantly, it's, it's like Christians think they're fighting against heaven. God ain't doing it. God ain't doing it. So let me bombard heaven. Your guns are aimed at the wrong place. The reality was Christ came, gave it all. Now he's given it as, as far as, you know, in the new covenant, 
but in the even since the beginning, he gave authority and dominion to men. He reminds us in Psalms 115, that the heavens is mine. And that's why men like Elijah and Elisha and Moses uh, did the things that they did because they understood a concept that they were responsible. There was a responsibility that took place in having faith for others. That these elements in natural life and natural living could be, and through faith, subject to them. Yes, subject to them. That's why Moses could, and when, it's, it's interesting when, when Moses tells the children of Israel, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, that it's God that says, Moses, why are you crying behind a rock? You go open it. What did I put in your hand? You go open it. He, God literally told Moses, you go open it. Um, that's crazy. And But but just, just see the trend. Read scripture. Don't just take theology. Don't just take sermons from what people have said that sounds to ease your conscience better. Search the scriptures and find out what it's asking of you and asking of me. Because the church don't look like the church and there's a reason for it. And so, so we get through Psalms. Um, and then we go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. It's a beautiful text, and I've heard it quoted many, many times, misquoted though, but I've, I've, I've heard it uh, said, and it says, for those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The first part we always talk about, and I always hear people say, and I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I grew up on, on the few Pentecostal church, and I've always said, well, I'm waiting upon the Lord. I'm waiting upon the Lord. I'm waiting for the Lord to lead, the Spirit of God to lead me. Well, he's not. He's not going to lead you anywhere. And if you're waiting, he's not going to go get you. Uh, very seldom would that happen. Very rare would that happen. And it's usually probably because it's a last resort. And there's literally no other option there and everything else. People think that's spiritual. That's not. That's very carnal. It's very, very carnal because God is literally having to tell you apart from faith and just trying to get you to be obedient. There's a difference between obedience and faith. And so what it's literally saying is I don't trust the spirit of God inside of me. I don't, I can't hear from God. I don't know what his voice sounds like. I don't know what it is to be led of the spirit. I don't believe the scriptures. So I'm going to wait for an audible voice to tell me what to do. That's very carnal, very natural. And Isaiah says something so important. He says, but those who wait on the Lord. Okay. What does waiting on the Lord mean then? Shall renew their strength. Okay. Let's look at that word renew. Renew does not mean the first go. If you're running and you're a runner, it means you're second wind. It means you are already in the process of moving and going that direction. And the renewing is the second wind coming in after you have exacerbated all of your energy. Okay, do you see where this is going? The waiting on the Lord is not you sitting there, really religious and holy. Waiting on the Lord is actually progressively moving forward towards the goal that Christ has called us to and the responsibility in which you and I walk. And in that, as we move from it from action, obedience, into faith. That is the renewing. That we move from obedience into faith. That it is that act that the Lord renews. We're going to go with some other scriptures and it'll, it'll hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping it's, this clicks. Uh, again, I'm, I know I'm kind of going through this quick, but I'm just praying this, this really helps you. We have to stop this thought process of waiting and not moving. No, I'm saying go, move. And as you release what you have, God steps in to give you what he has. That's called faith. Or like Smith Wigglesworth said, he said, I'm going to lay hands on the sick or cast out a devil. And whatever I fall short, I've got nine gifts of the spirit to tack on the end of it to get it done. That's the renewing part. That's the part of, okay, I got to get it done. A police officer might go into a bank robbery. Why? Because he shows up first on scene. And he's going to go in and he's going to do everything he can to confront that situation. 
while in the meanwhile, other officers are coming. While in the meanwhile, the SWAT team is being called up. But during that time, as he's waiting on them, he's not sitting there in his car doing nothing. He is reactionary and offensive to the enemy to try to save lives and deal with the situation as best that he can. And then once backup arrives, that's the renewing. But he's not sitting there doing nothing. That's what we've taught in the church to do nothing until God physically tells you to. That is natural. That is carnal. That is not faith. That is not obedience. That is nowhere in scripture. That is nowhere in scripture. And I want to make one of the, one of the things that I, I think we, we lack in discussing in the Christian church, especially the Pentecostal church, in that going part, in that renewing part, is the opportunity to grow, learn, practice, and grow up. Who, who in the world ever said that the supernatural is going to be perfect every time? Who made that up? I don't know of anybody that operates in the gifts that, or anybody that oper operates in the prophetic in any way ever started off getting it 100%. I don't know of anybody. I don't know of anybody that lays hands on the sick that operates out, that, that operates out of 100%. Maybe you have times and moments that, man, it's, it's like phew, everything's coming through. And victory after victory after victory. And, man, I, I've, I've lived those moments and I've had dry moments, too. Operating the gifts. I've been on. Sometimes I've been off. Sometimes I've been on but misinterpreted what I was hearing. So I had to learn how to apply that. And... But nowhere does it ever say that it has to be. That's why for Paul makes a statement in 1 Corinthians 14 about, you know, letting those that letting letting uh, prophecies be judged. That it's OK. To, and, and we do this in our in our life team. You know, somebody will give a word or something and we'll just be like, hey, hold on. Huh? Let's 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 walk this out. That was a good try. Uh, people, especially let's say if there's tongues and interpretation and people are like, well, you know. I felt it, but I got scared. Okay, that's fine. Now you know what it feels like. That was the Spirit of God uh, moving through you to give an interpretation. That, that's all that it was. So next time, now that you know what it is, pick it up. Operate in faith. Step out. If you make a mistake, practice here with us in our life team. Practice here with us. That way we safety, we protect you to sharpen your skill Hone your, hone your understanding of hearing God's voice so when you're out in work or with family or at the grocery store, when God gives a word to you, it's better sharpened and defined and your skill level is there to be able to operate properly. That's all that it means. I just want to close out showing you two verses here in Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, Luke writes, talking about Jesus, it says, And the child grew, became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. We never talk about Jesus growing in the spirit. We never talk about him in that way. Uh, same chapter, chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus' ministry grew. As the Holy Spirit led him, he grew in understanding too. Dude, that's a powerful understanding of discipleship. That is a huge thing. Because what we want to do is send people out there, you know, and that have it perfected. That's not what this is about. If you're going to learn, if you're going to learn how to operate in the spirit, you have to practice. I mean, you have to get out of the fear factor. And step into faith and allow the word to become true in you. There's no other route. There's no other way. There's no other alternative method. I can't give you a shortcut. There is no shortcut in scripture. You're going to have to scrape your knees, rub your elbows and get it in. Listen to the DHT from Curry. 
get into your get into a life team. You go, well, I don't have a life team. I oh, you know, I want to start a life team. Perfect. Go be DHT certified. Go on JJLM. Listen to the videos. Go on YouTube. Watch the stuff. Watch Marnie in Canada. Um, the stuff that we're putting out out there. Get into a life team. Use that. And but don't be double minded in it. As Paul said to the Galatians, why is it that you begin in the spirit and end in the flesh? Don't be double minded in it. Because, you know, like Yoda, I don't remember how the statement goes, but Yoda basically says, do not try, do. Well, that's what it is. If you're, if you're, if you're going to be double minded, you're going to see very little success. And at times you'll see it. Most of the time you won't. It's not until you have decided and you've made up your mind that, you know what? God gave me the responsibility that my I, I am my brother's keeper. That it is not until you take on the responsibility that you begin to see authority. True spiritual authority is not you usurping over mankind because of your pastoral position or role. It's garbage. It's fear. It's the enemy. That's all that it is. It's carnal. That is not spiritual authority. I don't care what you say. What it is, I don't care how, if you're a bishop, if you're a pastor, it doesn't matter. Spiritual authority, and anyone that is operated in spiritual authority will understand this very simple principle. Spiritual authority comes to responsibility. Responsibility of the work, responsibility of taking it on, responsibility to God, answering for what it is that you're doing. Spiritual authority rests in your responsibility to take it on. That's just what it is. If you're a police officer, the more authority you have in your city to operate in lawfulness and keeping your city safe is based on the responsibility you have taken to lay your life down. Every officer is called to lay his life down. But let's face it, not everybody does as much as others. So they are given more authority because they have taken on more responsibility. That's just how it works. If you're afraid to take on responsibility because you're afraid of what people would think, you're afraid of how of, of somebody dying on you, that it is horrible. It is horrible. I the losses that we have experienced at times, I can I remember the losses way more than I remember the wins. But I have to renew my mind to the fact that God's word is true and move on and keep on and encourage that family, even when it's done and love on that family, but continue to continue to move forward that God's word is true and that I am growing and that I'm learning in Christ. If Jesus grew, so can I. If you follow his ministry, the gospel of Luke, follow the miracles. You're going to notice there's a growth in the things that Jesus did. Whether it was casting out devils or healing the sick. As he grew, so did the miraculous. I promise you, it just works that way. Be confident. Don't stop trying. Don't stop. Don't stop laboring. Don't get discouraged. Connect. Connect with the life team. Connect with you. Well, I don't. I don't. I haven't perfected this yet. That's not what this is about. Get in the fight. You'll learn more that way than just thinking it through. I would never let a doctor operate on me. Well, I wouldn't go to doctor anyways, but I would be using that example. Well, I, I wouldn't let a mechanic overhaul my car who's never touched a car and only watched on YouTube. I wouldn't let him practice on my brand new car. Wouldn't. But I would trust someone who has gotten his hands dirty. I was a licensed contractor. One of the things that I learned, everybody wanted to get paid who told me they could do this and they could do that. And they had this skill and that skill. And they would give me all these things that they could do. Reality was this. I didn't need laborers. I needed somebody that could troubleshoot. So there's a difference between an electrician who can run some wires and do the basic stuff. And an electrician who can troubleshoot, who understands the entire process. That's the part that's hard to find. You and I are spiritual troubleshooters. You and I are not called to just come in and re figure out their psychological past. You and I are here to come to take dominion and authority and responsibility over our neighbors and over our loved ones and find the solution in Christ. And the solution is the same thing every time. In Jesus' name.
authority and dominion in the name of Christ in our in, through his word in which we live and we obedient to that. So, man, we're at 25 minutes, man, if time flies by. I hope this helped you. We're gonna, I'm going to do some more of these uh, as I get into that manual, uh, having faith for others. I just want you to know you're not alone. You're, it's okay to grow. It's okay to, to learn. It's okay to not get it all perfect in the beginning. But at the same time, practice. Lay hands on as many people as you can. And if you need help, reach out to us, reach out to JGLM, reach out to a local life team, look on the map and reach out because there's so many people that want to help you and assist you in that process. So this is uh, the hub, JGLM Life Team in Manteca, California. We love you. I encourage you right now in Jesus name, go be blessed, be obedient, operate in faith in Jesus name. Amen. Love you guys.